and we are live. Ooh. So let's see. Can uh, can we be heard? Let's uh, find out. <laughs> can you hear us? Can you Hello, hear us? world. Can we be heard? Hello. <laughs> <laughs> so this is uh, the awkward moment, I guess. The awkward uh, first moment, first show. <laughs> uh, I've got jitters a wee bit. Uh, Tatiana, you got jitters? Uh, kind of, yeah. Yeah. Phoenix, Robin, how are you feeling? <laughs> Ah, uh, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I like that confidence. We are all good. Apparently, we just got the message to, through to say that we are awesome. all good. So, well, uh, shall we begin? Absolutely. Uh, Tatiana, yeah. do you want to do the honors or? Sure, absolutely. Of course, my pleasure. So, hi, everyone. Welcome on the Al Control Show with your host, Alistair, and me, Tatiana. Um, and we will basically uh, talk with, let's say, playful hardware explorers or alternative controller games developers. Uh, Alistair and I are also doing this. So basically, this is a show by makers interviewing other makers. Um, maybe, Alistair, you would like to tell us a bit about alternative controllers. What are these? Yep. So uh, alternative controllers are controllers made using uh, physical objects. These are games that might involve screens, but they might not involve screens and could be used, made using your own materials, your own buttons soldered together, um, maybe motion sensors, uh, maybe Arduino programmable boards, things like that. Um, or they might repurpose existing objects, things like uh, wobbly door stoppers, for example. We've got someone on stream who's worked with those. Um, or paper shredders. Uh, we've got someone on stream who is me, who has made a game <laughs> out of paper shredders. And today we have uh, Robin Baumgarten, a German independent uh, game developer that is not based in London, but since recently. Um, he's basically the master of LED strips and king of wobblers. And we have <laughs> Phoenix Perry, uh, the OG playful hardware priestess, um, also roller skating since recently. How are you guys? Very good, thanks. <laughs> Great. So, so uh, yeah, <laughs> go on, Alistair, please. So, yes, I mean, one of the reasons we wanted to bring you together onto this stream is that we know that you were working together roughly this time last year um, on a on an installation called Forest Daydream. Um, so I thought it would be nice sort of uh, as an introduction for our audience uh, to show them a bit um, of what uh, Forest Daydream is so they can build a picture of it. And also, you know, maybe you'll have a few words you want to say about what that is and, you know, what you uh what we the process of making things like that um so i'm just going to switch over to there we go and we should have a little video here absolutely yeah great hello i am phoenix perry and i'm the course leader mm. here on the creative computing degree at the Creative Computing Institute. So yeah, this was the creative process, the, the making, the making this of uh, Forest Daydream, Daydream right? Phoenix, I think maybe you can tell us a bit about this. Yeah, sure. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, is there any yeah. audio inside of it? Can you hear it at all? Uh, yes, yes, we no. can hear it. I've just turned yeah. the audio down. Oh, okay. Um, do you want me to turn oh, okay. the audio up? <laughs> I think part of the, I mean, I think it's really interesting because this so goes into my practice quite a lot and why I do what I do and how I do it. So I might just let it play. <laughs> okay, I'll turn the audio back up. <laughs> Which looks like a low poly video game putt. So my thinking behind that is that we spend a lot of time in virtual natural environments when we meet in cities. So pulling where we actually end up going back out into the real world and looking at it as an object. Um, so that's why it looks the way it does and the kind of architecture it has. Beyond that, each piece is interactive and then there are games which play out amongst the pieces and they require multiple people to play. So something will be happening over here and then you'll need a response to it over here. So there's no way to play it on your own. So you have to ask for help and ask for cooperation, which is 
one of the underlying mm. philosophical points I'm trying to make in the game is that you can't do things on your own, you need to do them in groups. We have this class here that I'm leading right now on environmental computing and spatial computing. They are working with me on this project in an attempt to get experience working with a gallery, with a large scale institution like Welcome Collection. So it's a part of the pedagogical process of getting them from point A to point B, of being ready and able to work with the public and knowing what that looks like. Then from there, they're gonna to proceed to doing full-scale works all on their own in public spaces. Personally, I was rather focused on the programming of the microcontrollers. All the different parts have to interact with each other, have to talk with each other. So every, every button press has to be signaled somewhere else and all the different parts have to be co coordinated into one single game. You've got sounds going on and lighting and all these physical models. So these really create an environment. I hope like people coming would feel relaxed. I worked on the soldering and the wiring and I also helped with the construction of the dome and the trees. You are not designed for yourself, so you need to study how others behave and, uh, and they interact. My name is Ben Kelly. My role in Forest Daydream it was almost like a sound supervisor role to create an immersive soundscapes which evoke uh, the rainforest and also music composition. Los Bos Casinos is an ongoing project with the Wampi, the indigenous community who live near the Ecuadorian border of the Amazonas rainforest. I spent some time with them two years ago and developed an ongoing relationship as an artist uh, to help with their government to help deforestation and indigenous land rights. The sound recordings, the soundscapes are very immersive as a, again a hyper reality to try and aim to trigger this emotional feeling, this primal feeling of interconnectivity with nature. I hope it stimulates audience members to ask themselves questions of their own role within the social ecological system. We need outlets for social collaboration and communication as adults, and we don't get them enough. And we really have to think about how play sits in a modern society in, in new ways. It really is a beautiful piece. Like, uh, I mean, it's a shame that uh, it's sort of time in the spotlight got uh, cut short by uh, COVID, but I mean, it's, it is really good that you got to uh, develop that. Like, I understand that it's like this had been a long kind of a project that had kind of been brewing for a long time. Is that right? It is. Originally, Adele and I uh, designed it and built it for a maze in, I think, 2015. It was the year Robin uh, showed Line Wobbler for the first time. And I was a judge that year. That's how I met Robin. But um, <laughs> We showed it and we had a whole situation where uh, we tried to build it in Germany. So we had the plans and everything. And it turns out building things in Germany is not as easy as it sounds. Right. <laughs> mm. There's like a bunch of guild licenses and a bunch of like weird ways you have to get things. And like, as a foreigner, it was a real surprise. Wow. And we really underestimated the amount of time uh, that it would take to do. And we got it mostly done. And then uh, it ended up getting, it was supposed to be showed inside, but uh, at the last minute it got moved outside. And for anyone who's ever designed electronics, you know how wonderful that's going to be and how great that's going to go, particularly if you've made everything capacitive touch right. <laughs> <laughs> that relies on paint on wood. Right. <laughs> so... Uh, in the morning it worked when nobody was there, but by the time it hit the afternoon, like gone. Mm. Um, so, it's, and then by the evening, like I, it was just pretty lights and it was a real letdown because we put so much into it and like, it just didn't work out quite as we envisioned it. 
and it was really stressful. I don't think I've been that stressed out in a long time. Yeah. Like I was really freaking out. And Adele and I were, we learned a lot. It was a great lesson. <laughs> um, and we knew we wanted to do it again. And we knew that the project itself, this idea of collective interconnectivity and our inter interdependence with nature and the natural environment was something we knew we wanted to go back to. Um, and we kept trying to find, it's huge. It's a honking, huge exhibition, right? Mm. It feels mm. like almost a, I think it's like a 2000 square foot space. Like it's massive. Um, so it's not easy for me to just be like, I'm going to roll it out at this like little game festival. It's like, okay, I need a week to set up, mm. three days to tear down, <laughs> $2,000 to mount it. You know, it's like, it's not an easy thing. Um, so it was shelved for five years. Right. And I just sort of had conversations with people about it. And then Holly Gramazio referred me to a curator who is doing this thing called Welcome to Play It at the Welcome Collection, which is an amazing museum here in London that uh, does all kinds of interesting exhibitions. Um, and it has a very colonial past, which I'm slightly uncomfortable with. Uh, very uncomfortable with, but they do uh, good things now and they do a lot of interesting projects and they did welcome to play about play in adult uh, in adults. And they also had a, a really amazing games exhibition downstairs on play. And um, it was really fun to be in it. And they offered me a budget and a gigantic space and the curators at welcome believed in it enough to let me mount it again. Um, and Robin basically has worked on me with so many things. I feel like all my games deserve a, a slight <laughs> under tag. Also made by Robin Baumgarten. Uh, <laughs> right. The, the number of times I've called Robin in the middle of the night, like, help. Because <laughs> you were. Deadline's 5 a.m. tomorrow. <laughs> I haven't slept in a week. <laughs> Because you used to both be uh, living in London, is that correct? Down the street. Yeah. Down the street. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. so Robin would come over and help me, like, surface Mount Sodder a bunch of nonsense or, you know, just finish things up or help wrap projects. And he's he's worked on so many of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, of course, this came up and I just saw immediately of Robin because I thought that lit with his strips, uh, it'd be beautiful. And I knew he just decommissioned the Christmas tree. Mm. That's right. Yeah. So, so he had a ton of LEDs. <laughs> <laughs> Could you just uh, briefly describe the Christmas tree for us, just uh, for the audience who, at home who might not have seen it? Uh... Sure thing. So that was like a, a commission a while back for um, Games London. Um and they wanted uh, to make some uh, like a Christmassy exhibition. I think they were thinking of arcade games at first. Um, but then uh, we figured out we couldn't make a, a Christmas tree installation out of line wobbler. So that's like a weird uh, double helix spiral um, in the shape of a Christmas tree with like um, like two intertwining line wobblers. And there's like 100 meters of LEDs and I, I think 200 amperes of power. <laughs> Crazy. Oh, yeah, you have the strips there. Um, <laughs> That was, uh, when was that, like three years ago, I think. Um, mm -hmm. um, and we kept the, the whole thing in storage for like two years, um, but sadly nothing uh, came of it in the end. So I kind of took off the whole electronics in the end and kept them in a, in a box. And uh, luckily uh, we found a good use for them after that. Um, and I think I'm, I have another use for them coming up and like I still have lots of those LED strips lying around. So that's uh, came in very handy. We have some images of the King Cross Station Christmas tree. Maybe we can show it so people have a better idea, idea what uh, we are talking about just here. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm just uh, bringing yeah, them up now. It was a, yeah, it was a King Cross Station, I think. So that was like a big exhibit, <coughs> uh, public space and all. I mean, I assume it's a step for you to have this kind of exhibit in public spaces. It's not yeah. a challenge. Definitely very interesting. Um, also, like, you know, you have to go at 2 a.m. in the morning because there can't be any visitors there or, like, people who took the train while mm. you're installing this thing. So, like, being at the station at night and setting it up. And then all the people who would destroy it, basically, by running into it with their coffees in their hands without looking. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it was over Christmas <laughs> as well. And I was in Germany, so I had to phone someone. And 
have them go there at night and Skype call to repair. It was uh, quite a fun, uh, fun exercise. <laughs> Looks like it. Um, maybe uh, we should start telling people what's the plan for the show. Alistair, should I proceed? Yes, please do. Cool. So uh, the plan for the show is that we'll kick things off by chatting about your history with alternative controllers. And we'll then take some time for you to show us something. Don't say anything. Don't spoil anything at this point. Um, but it's something you've made or something you're working on. And then at the end, there is an interactive element for our audience to join in on. So uh, the audience, people in the chat, be prepared. And yeah, as the starter, actually, what interests us is how did you start making playful hardware or even just electronics involved in game design somehow? Uh, how did your, how did life put you on that way? Maybe you Phoenix, want to start? let's start. Yeah, yeah um, oh, sorry, as you wish. I just talked for a long time, Robin. You go first. <laughs> okay, right. let's go, Robin. Thank you. Let's go. Sounds Robin. good. Sounds good. Um, yeah, I uh, came to hardware from uh, mobile games first. So I was uh, making a couple of small mobile games, and uh, one of them was um, was doing well. So I said, okay, maybe I make a sequel. And like the first one had like little buttons, and then said, okay, maybe you make a game that has sliders um, instead of buttons, so like you know, slowly increasing complexity. Um, but at that time, I was also doing a lot of uh, game jams, digital game jams, where you you know make games in a really short time. And around that time, I think I saw people making, bringing like Arduino kits and like a box of random nonsense and stuff, and uh, you know sensors, inputs, outputs. And I said, okay, maybe I I use real sliders um, to make these kind of uh, little like little custom controllers for my game or. Uh, something like that. And uh, it kind of grew from there. And it was also just at that time, I think that was when the first Alt Control GDC was announced. And I said, okay, maybe this could be a cool thing where I make a physical uh, controller and I um, build it around these sliders and uh, just kind of started searching online, you know, what kind of sliders exist and what can you make with those? And, uh, you know, like immediately it grew in complexity as these things do. And I found there's like these sliders with motors, like, you know, like from these high-end DJ poles and said, oh, maybe you can force feedback in there as well. And um, so I, it, it kind of developed very much from like this mechanic first uh, approach where like, I've, oh, I have this sliding motion I want to experiment with and then go from there. And uh, that was basically the first project um, that was really like an, like an alt control project for me. Uh, before that, I, I dabbled a bit with Arduino and dabbled a bit with games, but I never really combined the two. And uh, I wasn't really aware of, uh, of a scene, you know, like um, that probably Phoenix will shed some light on later. Um, uh, but uh, that was my first dabble in, into that. And um, that was immediately shown at Alt Control GDC, like, you know, GDC, the biggest uh, games conference in the world, which was crazy from, from like, you know, zero to like this massive show floor. And uh, it was a great experience. And that basically got me hooked on uh, making more hardware things and then having them shown there and at other places. And uh, the, my sole motivation was basically just to uh, show weird stuff to people. And, and like, there's no, you know, secondary objectives in the beginning for sure. Mm. Because your background is in programming from the, 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 in the first place, right? You used to program AI and actually started researches, right, about this? Yes, oh, exactly. I, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And you used to work with more traditional video game, like you even worked on DEF CON at some point as a consultant, I think. So yeah. that's quite a stretch. Um, <laughs> and but do you think actually? So I, I try to get familiar with uh, two players reactor and four players reactor, which mm -hmm. is I think the main mobile games you made, and it's already about local multiplayer. Uh, and there's this seed of what became later um, the kind of fun you can find in your installation. Do you think it's something that evolved from there, a, a will to actually share local multiplayer experience through unexplored devices? Yeah, definitely. I mean, and you you mentioned that I, yeah, I'm, I definitely started from the programming side. So like uh, as a typical programmer, you have 
you know, no knowledge of uh, graphics or aesthetics. So everything mm. I made was incredibly ugly in the beginning. Uh, <laughs> just programmer arts or Googling for uh, royalty-free icons. And um, that kind of also pushed me towards like this uh, concept of creating fun between players where the, the fun or the the content not necessarily happens on a screen, but between people, you know, like mm -hmm. this typical uh, local multiplayer concept where people have fun with each other rather than just use the game as a vehicle, not as like the, the core of the experience. And um, yeah, that uh, the two player reactor game was um, surprisingly successful. I think it's a, um, a couple million downloads. I mean, it's a free game, so I didn't uh, become rich of it, but um, <laughs> that, that definitely um, you know, it's like a game where you press a button. And that gave me the idea to make a like a sequel with a slider. I never made the mobile game in the end, but just stayed with the with the hardware. Um, but it's definitely what got me into into this uh, hardware. Nice. Um, I have follow up questions, but of course we will uh, maybe switch to Phoenix first. Uh, I have the same question for you, Phoenix. How did you get into hardware and electronics in games? What was your background before that? It's really easy. <clears throat> Sorry, my voice gave out while I was sitting there not speaking for a minute. Okay. Uh, it's amazing. I had to continually talk. Uh, I originally started doing a lot of video work. So I was an independent filmmaker. So mm. I was already kind of really interested in analog processes and making film. I also had a development background and I moved to Silicon Valley um, actually to work in an art gallery, which a film gallery, why not? Wow. It's in San Francisco. And then I got a job in Silicon Valley as a dev and I ended up getting really, really sick because Silicon Valley in 98, 99 and 2000 was crazy. Right. And I slept under my desk and got really just really, really sick and mm. ended up disabled, uh, didn't work for five years. And during that period, uh, 2001, the Xbox came out mm. and my hands were so ducked. I couldn't, after years of playing games, I couldn't play this thing. Mm. And I was so angry. And I was like, I had to watch my boyfriend at the time play Splinter Cell, which I really wanted to play. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, these controllers are garbage. And I also couldn't use regular input devices anymore. So I started building giant buttons for myself to do like video mixing and film hacking and stuff. So I hacked a Videonics video mixer with like giant silver knobs with uh, my friend Travis Throckel, who went on to found Obscura Digital. And we built this giant interface for me to make films with uh, and experimental video. It was really awesome. And from there, I was just like, interfaces suck. <laughs> <laughs> they need to be better. They need to not hurt people. How about that? Just baseline. Um, so I went down like a really long path of exploring interface design that led to eventually me asking, do I need a controller? Can I do it all with like a camera and machine learning? So mm. I started collaborating with Rebecca at the time. She's now Dr. Rebecca Feebrink. She's very fancy <laughs> now. Back then she was doing her PhD and I was running an art gallery and it was all kinds of chaos. But she created this tool called Weckinator that lets artists use machine learning to use, to create gestures that will control things. And you can just use a camera. So. I had this band called Black Swan. Um, we played at Baby Castles, uh, which was really fun, and did a bunch of like crazy, weird, experimental, gesture-based control stuff with the Connect. And I was part of the early Connect hacker community. I was part of this lab with Doug Wilson, Kaho Abe, Catherine Isvester, Kristen Demurio, Chris Demurio, a ton of other amazing people were in the lab at the time. And I really just wanted to do a game jam around hardware games around building games with things that were not, you know, controllers. So this was like 2011, I think, 2000. Yeah, I think it was 11. And I looked at Chris, I was like, we gotta come up with a name for this thing. And my friend, Sarah Grant, had just gotten this control ring that I adored. And I was like, Chris, I wanna call it control something. And, and Chris was just like, what about alt dot control? Like alt dot 
you know, stuff on Usenet. And I was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, that was really awesome. Make Magazine sponsored it, um, as well as Adafruit, It Got Orange Press, Caho, and Catherine judged it. The games that came out were super fun and wacky. And there was the one that won was this like multiplayer tank that was made with cardboard and it was like a whole tank interface and it was just wow. amongst four people. It was super great. And then, um, yeah, all kinds of weird games, connect games, hardware games, weird interfaces. The only rule we had was you can't use traditional input devices. Uh, so that was very exciting. And then we did a second one, but it spread like wildfire. We got an email very shortly after from some Russian folks who said, can we do it in Russia? And we were like, Yes. And then literally it went to Copenhagen like within months. And then a couple months later, it's at GDC. And I was like, what the hell happened? Wow. <laughs> and it was, it, it just went and now it's the whole thing. I'm doing my doctorate on it, which feels very crazy and weird. And I've interviewed everybody from the old, old days, except for Tatiana, who I should probably interview. And uh, yeah, kind of trying to get a sense out of like why people do what they do how they got into this how they got here because i just came up with a snappy name for a game jam uh but this was going on before that i i didn't create this community at all it was already like as robin said people were starting to show up with weird things everywhere it was just hardware games was kind of what i was thinking of them as <clears throat> so i obviously wasn't alone and Chris is amazing. He now runs a hack space called NYC Resistor in New York. And uh, he's a cool cat. So that's kind of how I got into this. OK. Um, actually, what uh, I, I read, so um, it feels like there is two parts of this, like maybe coming from the videos to games and playfulness. But I've read that you actually um, for few for some years worked with uh, Kinex and gesture mm -hmm. controlled games. So I assume that segs smoothly uh, from more traditional video game, let's say, to our control-ish stuff. Um, did this phase on well, phase maybe is not the right world, but you got the idea. Like that, this did this moment uh, working with weird controllers but still like uh the industrial one like flip motion kinect stuff that are based on motion capture shaped somehow uh your creative um process after after that on out control on the way you do out control games not so much because <laughs> okay. i was already doing it with a camera the only reason i chose mm. the connect and started helping with the hacking community is because I could use the connect at baby castles in the dark. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so like I was already building like weird alternative. Uh, I was making these like group play puppets that had little lily pads sewn into them with conductive thread that kids yeah. could play with around their emotions. emotional growth. I think yeah, the emotional growth is one of them. Yeah. Uh, okay. Emotional growth was actually ended up being a screen installation, but this one was kind of a piece of emotional growth. Yeah. Um, okay. Maybe so, I'll start. We can show yeah. emotional growth. Because How I the hell did you find this? <laughs> <laughs> I spent days stalking you online. So I, I don't even know where this is. <laughs> okay. But that's really nice. So it's really a video of a work in process, I, mm -hmm. I guess, um, where we, you, we can um, see. Phoenix so basically, what I got was there is two puppets with lily pads. And based mm -hmm. on the, the gestures and movement mm -hmm. you will do, it will react uh, differently in the game mm -hmm. and the point to trigger gentle play in a way yep. if i got it right okay oh my god <laughs> so, yeah <laughs> I so it was a really work in progress video but we can see actually the electronics in mm -hmm. it which i really mm -hmm. enjoyed and already some conductive wires which mm -hmm. uh well you keep on using right now mm -hmm. so it was really uh a step i guess in the in the process so it feels mm -hmm. like it at least have you ever noticed this, Robin? It's downstairs when you take your shoes off in my house. I have it sitting there. <laughs> Maybe. By the record player. Uh, I think I've seen this, yeah. Yeah. 
And so um, can you tell us a bit, Phoenix, what was the uh, intention, experience intention you had with this? I mean, uh, you work? nailed it. That was it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was exactly it. Uh, it was okay. the first thing that I worked on with Rebecca. So um, yeah, I really wanted kids to be able to explore, explore like using gesture to kind of create different, there's this like plant in the center and the way you moved it changed how the plant grew. Um, so I really was thought, I was really interested in looking at that space between gesture and what was on screen. And so that was the first time I tried that. It was pretty wild and out there, especially given the year. I, this was so early. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, oh, I but think that's what we are here. Yeah. Yeah. No, I just, I think there's this really interesting connection between both of your work here because you've got, uh, you know, the work that you were doing with mm -hmm. this and the work that you were doing with, uh, connect as well phoenix mm -hmm. and you know and i feel like you know the where it feels like you're taking these is in a very kind of gestural direction where it's about mm -hmm. making lights and sounds and effects and it's not necessarily about sort of game goals it's not necessarily a you know these aren't things that can be won or lost these are things that can be toyed with things that can be explored mm -hmm. um and I kind of feel like that's something that I've been seeing in uh, your work, Robin, quite a lot recently is, you know, so I can see in the background, I can see uh, your uh, wobble sphere there, which is oh, a yeah. very recent piece of your work, um, which I understand evolved from an earlier piece called Wobble Garden. And that evolved from the line wobbler, which we saw earlier as the Christmas tree. Um, and my understanding of that piece is that... Uh, that it is much more about kind of creating the visual effects and, you know, it is about, you know, creating these beautiful swarms of colours with the LEDs. So, I mean, I don't I'm just curious, like, is there something that's kind of, are you both being driven by a similar desire to create, you know, pulling you through? Or is this actually just kind of, is this separate desires kind of pulling you in a similar direction, you know? Like, what is, could you tell us about the sphere and where you're trying to go with that? Yeah, sure. I mean, that'll, uh, I'll show it later as well um, in the in the demo section. Um, but I think it's also a bit part of the process of like working with these things is like, uh, uh, for me, at least it, it, the, you know, the, the interaction and the experiment comes first and then I experiment myself and like use it to see what can I do with this? What can I, what can it express? What can others do with it? And uh, all of this is an ongoing process that isn't by any means complete, right? So um, I try to just kind of see and, and basically interact with the device itself to see if it kind of tells me something that it should be. Um, and so with like Wobble Garden and Wobble Sphere, it's definitely more, uh, kind of a reactive kind of uh, experiment, like exploratory playful vibe rather than where it was line wobbler where it was like a very kind of straight edge uh, arcade game, uh, right? Um, so with, uh, but you know, that might change in the future as well. So right now I, I do like this kind of um, ambient vibe it has um, and I'm trying to make more modes. I want to see, can you do uh, a game on it, like an arcade game? Can you make multiplayer games that have, mm. that are goal driven, right? Um, but I do like this kind of, just like as a, as a mood object, as a kind of very ambient game. I, I do like this, how it came out. In the beginning, I was very much, maybe it's my, my programmer mindset thing. Ooh, I need to have a goal. I need to have <laughs> rules. I need to have mechanics and it needs to be a win state, you know? It's like very classic thinking of video games. I'm very much uh, old school in a way. Um, and it took me a long time to overcome this and saying, okay, no, I'm mm. cool with this. I'm cool with experimentation. I'm cool with exploration, with like, no win uh and and I'm, I'm still struggling a little bit with it so i'm kind of still thinking oh can i make something like a real game out of it but i think that's like uh, uh not the right way of thinking in a way nah nah <laughs> i've never made a real game the only thing i made that was real i was paid for like yeah. you know real what the heck is that anyway <laughs> exactly that's interesting, Robin, about the, the time it gets you to make your creative process or even maybe identity in a way evolve. Because basically, um, apparently, so you made 
at least 32 jams between 2013 and 2015. It's a lot. <laughs> Some of them uh, were like awesome jams, not to say that the others are not, but I'm thinking about Zoom Machines, which used to be like a really great alt control jam. I'm thinking about Splash, which, which is on the boat, the train jam where you cross the US, and of course, Exile. Uh, in Denmark, which is really mm -hmm. nice to be isolated in the countryside. And it's also, I think, where you did Line Wobbler, which happens That's to right. become your most famous piece, I guess, or at least it looks like it's really the piece you're known for, at least nowadays, for sure. Um, and the thing is, after Line Wobbler, um, you didn't do that much LED for like two or three years. So mm -hmm. I was wondering, like, uh, is the fact that Line Wobbler got 10 awards and 110 exhibits, I counted them all. Uh, I'm <laughs> short my numbers. Um, did, did at some point, like, you felt like, okay, uh, I'm doing a lot of wobblers and LEDs. I need to do other stuff like Night to Meet You, Rotator, uh, Schrodinger's Litter Box, and Rubber Arms, because Rubber Arms is really about the playfulness you're mentioning. Yeah, I mean, there wasn't really, uh, at least in the beginning, there wasn't really... Uh... Uh, like an, a need to kind of continue with LEDs. I was just like a, a basically a random output medium I chose. I basically, I, I didn't even bring an LED strip to that jam that was just there in, in uh, a box that I think Tim Garbos brought along with him was like arcade buttons and everything. I, I just came with the idea for this uh, joystick for the spring um, and I brought this and a sensor. Um, and so the whole game came together somewhat randomly and chaotically at this jam. And, uh, but, you know, in the end, I really love um, LEDs as an output meme, as you now can see, but especially in the beginning, that was just, you know, random choice. So it wasn't really something I needed to step away from in the first place, because I, I didn't really step into it too much. It was just, uh, okay, let's use this. Mm -hmm. And then at, at the next jam, let's see what, you know, what else is in the box, basically. So it was very much guided by just random discovery. And I really, that's also why I did so many jams. I really enjoyed this this process of kind of, you know, um, taking a random thing and saying, oh, what, what, what is this? What can this do? What, you know, what affordances does it provide? What interactions, what plays, uh, what games can be made out of this? And uh, I, this process, I really enjoyed. And um, I think it, you know, it takes a while to kind of hone this skill as well, to kind of come up with these um, things. Um, and that's also one reason why I did so many jams. And in the end, all of the jams I did were entirely hardware driven, like no, uh, solely digital games um but yeah it, it was um it was a random step into like the led world but it definitely i definitely feel at home there now it, it feels like a mm. like a cool way to express myself without having to rely on you know fancy 3d render technology or uh, even mm. uh, pixel art or, or kind of complicated things do you think the minimalism of leds is actually a constraint that help you express yourself in a way yeah, hundred percent. I mean, I, I as I mentioned before, I'm I'm definitely not a uh, not a not an artist in a yeah, way that I can um, magic up beautiful um, things, and in a way you can see that with line wobbler, the graph, the, even the colors are very, uh, you know, standard colors: red, green, mm. and, and orange, and a little bit of blue, I think. Um, but uh, yeah, it definitely helps. And it also the limitation uh, to these kind of minimalist things where you don't have text, where you don't have even images um, to convey meaning is, helps me a lot with, with coming up with gem ideas. Maybe we should show a quick video of Line Wobbler. I know yeah. it's a really famous piece, but it's possible that some people uh, don't know what we are talking about for the last three minutes. So <laughs> just in case. Um, so this is one of the many videos of Line Wobbler you can find online. Uh, Robin should probably talk about this, but um, yeah, we can maybe mention that the, the, the process, the creative process, the inspiration for this is a funny story that uh, Robin uh, told in many interviews. Maybe Robin, you can just in few sentences tell, <laughs> tell again the story of, of the cat. Of the cat, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, 
So I, yeah, that's, it's basically all about this joystick, right? This joystick is a, is a spring. Um, and the inspiration from this came from a cat playing with a doorstopper spring, reaching under, with paw under the door <laughs> and, and flinging that spring. There it is uh, in the video, or probably slightly delayed for me. But uh, uh, yeah, um, and uh, when I thought like, oh, if cats can have fun like this with the springs, maybe humans can too. And uh from there, it was a really small step to uh, putting a sensor on it and then figuring out what to do with it. And um, in a way, it was uh, good luck that I found this LED strip and um, kind of came up with this game uh, together with Matthias Maschek at this game jam. And then from then on, I took it further and kind of honed it uh, into uh, this kind of really compact and condensed experience that it is now. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So as time is running quickly, maybe uh, we could come back to Phoenix and talk about what I think is your most famous game. I'm, well, a playful experience. Uh, I'm thinking about boat, uh, boat party, of course. Uh, is it fair to say that it's your most famous experience? At least that's how I heard about you, Phoenix. I think it's the one that's shown the most. So yeah. that's that's definitely uh, definitely true. It was a really uh, wonderful project. Just grew and grew and grew, and I've worked on it for several years. I plan to keep working on it in different versions and different uh, iterations. It's a game about holding hands with strangers, and <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's got two modes. The first one that you're seeing in the video now is mode one, which was my initial mode, and I developed it with Frida Abtan. And I was really interested in how you could use gesture to explore sound. So there's a lot of gesture stuff going on in the back end of Bot Party and a lot of subtle signal processing that makes it work that way. People sometimes think it's like at the making making. And I'm like, no, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> I wish it was that easy. Uh, no. <laughs> does the making making know what point is contact? No, it does not. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, it, it, it was really a delight to work on because I personally don't like to touch people that I don't like being touched. So I decided to kind of dive into that. Like, why? How do we do this? So letting 3,000 people touch me in one year was an experience. <laughs> <laughs> and it really changed me and it showed me how much people need a hug. Like, really, like some people played and got like teary and some people freaked out and some people kissed each other. And I saw all kinds of things happen with Bot Party. And mm. I ask you to touch a stranger a hundred times in three minutes. You know, it's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. But this is the freeform mode. that's all sound exploration. The second mode, which I think you'll see a little bit later on in this video, is, uh, and I, Robin's in the later part of it too, it is uh, goal driven. So I decided to experiment with having something that had a goal. And then people went crazy. And I was like, wow, if you put a goal in something, <laughs> you get to go to Indicate finally, or not Indicate, but GDC finally. I've definitely been to Indicate. But, uh, Indicate is not quite so restrictive. <laughs> but, yeah. uh, you know, you get to go to GDC finally, finally. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I've been to GDC once before with my game Crystal on, so that's a little a little harsh. But um, yeah, I uh, yes, this is a goal based version, and uh, tons of people can play it. Like I've had over twenty people play it concurrently. Um, and yeah, it's just a game about human kindness and interconnection and pro social behavior and triggering as much dopamine in your brain in three minutes as I possibly can to make you a little bit nicer for the rest of the day. <laughs> as time is uh, running quickly, maybe that would be a good transition for you, Phoenix, to show us uh, actually the parts of both party you have. Alistair, Ooh. do you think we should do this? I need warning because you guys had me disconnect from Zoom. So I would have to stand yeah. up and bend over and stuff. That's yeah, sure. Absolutely fine. Well, while uh, Phoenix is switching over the cameras, what we could yeah. do is introduce the interactive element. Um, absolutely. Because we have uh, come up with a little interactive element for you all to take part in our, at home, which uh, our lovely guests uh, will be uh, taking part in towards the end of the show. So... <laughs> Our challenge for you um, at the end of the show for like the final five minutes or something will be to come up with a new idea for a, uh, for an alternative controller or an alternative controller game. Um, 
made using objects suggested by the audience. Now, the audience can type into chat. If you type anything into chat, beginning with an exclamation mark, that will become a uh, object that uh, our guests might uh, be able to use. Um, so, for example, I'm just going to type into someone's typed cactus uh, into the thing, and that should be added in. I've got a little bit of a uh, little bit of uh, wrangling to do to make this work. There we go. We've already got people adding objects to the toolbox. So, <laughs> in the so, final yeah, um, segment of the show. The uh, yeah, go the ahead, stream Katia. is a bit messed up. Yeah, the, the, the stream is a bit messed up right now. It's because we switched to have two screens coming from, two cameras coming from Phoenix. Uh, everything will go back to normal in a minute. Sorry for the interruption, Alistair. That's okay. Uh, do, we want, uh, do we want to switch to the simplified view uh, just for this while we've got the five cameras up? Yeah. Yep, yeah, I will do that. Uh, there we go. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> we planned ahead. Yeah. <laughs> so yes, uh, well, Phoenix, do you want to tell us about the uh, the bots uh, that are on camera? Sure, now? sure, sure. Uh, so this was a exploration into sound that started with uh, BabyBot. Uh, so I, like Robin and like you, Alistair, have no idea what I'm doing most days. <laughs> and I just know that I want people to interact together and I make these kind of provocations and stick them in a gallery and see what comes out the other side. Uh, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, but when it's good, I try and keep working on it. So this Zoraida Butler, who's now the um, curator at Amaze, curated this in her Playful Arts Festival in Holland. And I loved being in that show because she let me build basically anything I wanted. And I built this little bot and um, it's a synthesizer that connects to a step sequencer that is big enough that multiple, multiple people can play it together. So it just sat there and people played with it and made sound. And I was really surprised just like the act of making music together, how often people would just stick around for like a good chunk of time. So that was kind of cool to see. And I knew that I, I kind of had something with that group interaction. So then I made the version that you saw in the video, which is, these, uh, the gold uh, or the blue, the pink and silver bot, which were just the open ended sound exploration. Uh, there were a lot of good things that came out of this, but then there was a lot of things that were, I thought could be optimized. So from here, I did a bunch of play testing and collected a bunch of data and kind of thought really deeply about, you know, the player comments that happened uh, at the time. And from that came this version, which is the version that is the kind of has this version is actually inside this version. Uh, so this version has two buttons and you can either go back to play this mode or you can play this mode, which is the goal based um, mode that people love and is really fun. Um, so these three ladies come from that and they light up. So there's no indicator of the indicator of which bot needs to connect to which bot the eyes light up, but it's not a strong enough indicator. So these boxes glow and that just works. Um, but yeah, each time along the game design got better, the interaction got smoother and I kept adding new rules. I worked with Charlie Ann Page on this version um, and she is a amazing designer and amazing developer. And we had a really good time working on this. So that's the, uh, and Brian Jackson did the sound for this version, so. I mean, uh, awesome. I'm curious about the sort of the process of um, creating this. I mean, was it something mm -hmm. that you had a kind of, you know, a, a kind of idea for how it was going to work and that you kind of put into oh, no. and put into the world? Okay. I mean, no idea. Right. Okay. So where I was, just... the, was there a point where it kind of, it clicked that you had the right combination mm -hmm. of bots and inputs that you went oh, this is the one where I feel like it's working. You know, this is the one where I feel like it's doing what I want it to do. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's behind me. Uh, I got an oscilloscope for Christmas after the year that I did this one. Mm -hmm. And I realized that I got really into looking at uh, what would happen with the oscilloscope with like different 
things going on because I was just interested in oscilloscope. And that's when I realized I could probably use machine learning to like detect different interruptions. Right. So like I could probably work out like if some signals were crossing that the distortion would be clear enough in the waveform that I could pick it up with machine learning. So after that, I was like, I, I had the idea and I wrote Holly Gramazio again. And from now play this, he was lit. I feel like Holly and Robin have done such good things for me that I owe them so many cups of tea and so many cups of coffee and snacks and cakes. Uh, but I said, hey, Holly, I've got this crazy idea. <laughs> um, how about this game that is about uh, that lets me, uh, strangers make music together while holding hands? And she goes, I love it. <laughs> And uh, she put it in uh, Now Play This, and that was this version. So uh, from this version, I, I listen to what players say a lot. I take a lot of time to analyze what they say after I record things. I take notes. I think really hard about it. Um, and I knew that what worked about this version was how the interaction that was occurring between people touching the object together. So that's kind of how this arose. Um, right. That's okay. fascinating. I just, it's yeah, really like... and um, maybe as we have eight minutes left, uh, Robin, you also prepared stuff to show us, so maybe we can <clears throat> transition well without further ado, actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, so I have two things. Um, one thing is already plugged in, actually, and it's actually the LED strips you can see behind me. Um, I'm not sure how well they come out, but... Um, it's actually um, a little bit on the lines of like a kind of a line wobbler, um, what else can you do in that space kind of experiment. And I found these um, big, let me get this up here, um, big boards that I used for... Um, wow. <laughs> uh, for physiotherapy. So they used, um, you actually stand on them Um so they're like, uh, I think when you have, you know, like broken an ankle or something, uh, mm. uh, you uh, kind of uh, trying to relearn your motor, motor skills by standing and kind of balancing on it. And uh, all I did is really just kind of uh, glued a little accelerometer down there. And then um, you can already see it going on in the background. Um, so it's basically just oh, two yeah. axes. Um, and um, if I can hold it straight, so like one is like left and right. And the other one is forward and back. And then I said, okay, what else can I, what can I do with this? So um, right now the game is very, very simple still. It's just like uh, very much uh, like inspired by line mobile. It's like you collect things. Mm. It's like, you can see there's a little lava thing. Um, but yeah, the, it's, it's very kind of tricky to play. I can try it uh, while, and hopefully not falling. <laughs> yeah, sure. Please do, um, please do. Don't get hurt. Be I don't safe. know if I should look into the camera or, well, let's see. Um, so, well, you can see the blue lines. I don't know if I'm standing. No, we we can see really the LED. Uh, yeah, because, oh, yeah, that's better. Right? Yeah. I'm, there's a, a secondary mode with uh, playing with your butt. So I'm going to say. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> safety mode. Yes. Uh, so you can kind of control them and collect these green things. And then okay. uh, there's like lava. And, uh, but yeah, so this is very much a very early stage of uh, the game design. So I'm still working mm. on what what things should there be. And I have like a little uh, key and unlock mechanic. Um, and I'm going to work more on this. And um, the idea was some, to build something that doesn't use your hands. I mean, I guess it's a, a little bit inspired by uh, by Corona, the right? Um, wow. Yeah, for sure. Um, so saying, okay, you know, where can I go? without um, maybe with like line wobbler and all the other wobble experiments, they need uh, touch and uh, also with the uh, wobble garden and uh, wobble sphere, capacitive touch. So you can't even use a glove, right? So it's mm. like mm. Uh, not ideal for a pandemic scenario. So like, yeah, what can we do? And I found these boards, uh, they work quite well. So I'm going to keep working on this. And maybe there's like a, like a pass into physiotherapy as well, like making the games useful for actually, um, uh, um, but I have to talk to actual experts to see if, if the movements are proper, you know, if not, you just don't learn kind of weird behavior because you don't really use normal uh, movement. And then I made, this is going to be it's quite noisy, I guess. Um, yeah, I would have asked if you didn't show uh, <laughs> Wobble Sphere because this is, it's technically, it's impressive. 
Yeah, so this is Wobble Sphere. It's a it's a direct uh, successor to Wobble Garden, which is the same thing but flat. Um, so this is um, uh, Wobble Garden but round. Uh, so it's a seventy-two sided polyhedron, uh, um, very much like the football shape. Um, so it has pentagons and then hexagons between. Um, each side is made out of uh, a circuit board, which I had custom made. Um, which is surprisingly easy now. I always compare it to ordering T-shirts online. You just I mean, you okay. need to do a bit more, but once you have the design, you just send it off and you get it back uh, a couple of weeks later. Um, and it's not plugged in right now, so I don't know if we have time, but maybe uh, I can plug it in while we do something else um, um, in, like, yeah, in a minute can, or two. We can, we can show uh, it off. Well, we have four minutes, so maybe we can uh, start to have a look at what the, the chat yes, sent us. Yes, well, I mean, if you want, you can plug it in while we're... Because I really want to see it lit up. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, why not I want both. both at the same time, you know? Exactly. Chaos. This is what we're looking for. Yes. <laughs> Love chaos. So I've just got to bring it oh, Yeah, up. Phoenix, could you yes. uh, shut down the second camera so the yeah. um, display will totally. come back? Totally. Awesome. Let me um, work out how to do it. So I'm going to press a button and we're going to see... Oh, I'll wait for Phoenix to be... I'm working on it. Sorry. Right. It's no kind of hard. No, no problem. No problem. Just take your time and disconnect from the other Zoom session. That's great. Sorry. And... My laptop is behind me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like well, literally. Roby managed here. not to hurt himself. So I, please do the same. We don't want anyone <laughs> hurt. This time. This time. Not on our show. Okay. <laughs> there you go. I'm trying to leave. Yeah. I, I definitely got it, much more cuts and burns and everything since I started doing hardware games. It's uh, oh my god, second nature. <laughs> I cut myself today getting this out, and I was like, "Yep, shit, just oh, sorry, uh, it just got real. I'm bleeding. Yep, that's right." <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> All right, just need to find a way to hold this up. Oh my god, that's so beautiful. Stunning. Oh my god, hey. so. It's, uh, I don't even know the mode it is in now, but it should react to uh, when you touch it, it makes these circles. Um, oh, yeah. Yes. And wow. uh, this one is a, just a very slow mode. And I found it worked really well when I uh, put the, like when you touch it somewhere, the opposite side of the touch turns the opposite color. So when it sits on, uh, like even on that shelf back there, except the USB cable is not long enough now, it, it really lights up in an, you know, like the, the in a contrasty way, which is kind of cool. So this one is very ambient. It's just kind of does like little light things. And there's like a few different modes, but I don't know if I, maybe I can bring them up. Um, just need to press random numbers to see. Probably gonna crash. Ooh, yes. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this one is like little worms and stuff. Th this is fine oh, for yeah. epilepsy, right? I'm just thinking about this right now. Like people yeah. that have epilepsy uh, don't have a problem with this. Yeah, right? There shouldn't be fast flashing except when the okay. power supply stops working or something, but it uh, uh, should be fine. Okay. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, uh, so I mean, uh, we're running low on time, right? So we should do something. I mean, it's. I, it's, I can it's, leave it here and. Uh, <laughs> it's not a hard. I mean, it's not a. It's not a hard cut off time. So if you both have time to uh, continue, like, is that fine with you to like I've run on a bit? Got no life. No life. No life. Yeah. <laughs> Robin, are you just in the same boat? Yep, absolutely. Super. So I mean, we have so a question in the chat that I think is quick to answer and interesting. Do you think you could make a version of Wobble Sphere that is <laughs> strong enough to be a football? Or do you think it would be way too fragile, too weak? Uh, it could be possible. I mean, it's... Um, oh. uh, let me just put this down for now. D it's uh, just a quick question because we are running yeah, late. As you I said, think so. But... Uh, it's surprisingly sturdy. I just um, put it together with some 3D printed stuff. And it, it's like you can probably drop it and nothing happens. It's going to be painful to kick, but uh, maybe that's... The <laughs> that's the pro yeah, that's the player's problem. Got it? Okay. <laughs> so, okay. I just want to say there is something really, really beautiful about it as a piece of work, which is how three-dimensional it is. You know, when we're in mm. alternative controllers, we are working in a space where, you know, where the 3D world is kind of part and parcel of what we do. 
but this is a piece that kind of you know like a piece of sculpture you know with a sculpture you have to move around it mm. to see it from all the angles you know and wobble sphere has the same thing is that you know when you see the light start at one point and move around the sphere you want to move around with it you want to enjoy that kind of it kind of puts you in a space where you want to like see this thing from every angle and i think there's just something really kind of really kind of beautiful about that sorry yeah, to for interrupt sure. i just wanted to blend yeah, in yeah. with that <laughs> mm. using the space in interesting ways is definitely one thing you can kind of do that is different from just on the screen vr goes in a similar way i guess but uh it's much nicer when it's tactile i feel yeah I totally agree i also saw phoenix was holding up something that was three-dimensional and round and beautiful oh uh this this was just a piece from the original version of forest daydream that you i originally designed a throw around had an accelerometer in it and it lit up and the goal was to be able to toss it about and uh it would control sound being thrown but i quickly learned that the sharp edges were not your friend <laughs> And <laughs> someone hit their face Ooh. right here. Whoa. Oh, no. And that's when I stopped throwing it. <laughs> <laughs> Oof. But is it's there, really beautiful. Is there, I mean, is there a part of you that would want to see if you could make the same thing with something softer? Or is the kind of the hard objects, is that a kind mm -hmm. of limitation you have to work with? No, there's cushions inside Forest Daydream. Um, right. My plan with the next version is to make those cushions reactive and soft mm -hmm. because without doubt, kids loved those things. I, I We saw so many amazing interactions. They were so good for laying on and kids stacked them and threw them and rolled them and dove onto them. And I, I really want to light them up with LEDs and an accelerometer. I just, I there was a limit to how much time I had mm. with, with building it this time, but I absolutely love things you can throw and love things that you can like toss because mm. I saw an amazing installation once by an arts collective called Lovid, and they had a laptop and they started it. They played the Bee Gees Staying Alive on it. This is a thing that happened in my gallery at Devotion <laughs> in New York. And they were passing the laptop back and forth. And then each time they took a step further apart and a further apart and further apart. And they kept throwing the laptop. And it mm. was so awesome because the Bee Gees would be like, Staying Alive. Staying Alive. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was so wonderful and that was a, a show that we did with baby castles and a bunch of other amazing people like the art collective jody and kaho were in it uh aaron bartold it was a fun show wow that sounds amazing i mean we are it's a shame we, we are going to have to wrap up soon which is a real shame <laughs> because uh i'm really enjoying hearing about all of this um but we do have time to reveal to you your five objects. Um, so <laughs> let are you ready to see what you can come up with? Sounds good. I'm terrified. All right. <laughs> okay. Your objects as chosen by Twitch chat are a hula hoop, a saucepan, a bucket, a Roma robot, and soap. Mm, soap. Do we have to use all these things together? Or can it be one of these things? Follow your heart. Follow your heart. What's your, what's, uh... <laughs> as much as possible, I'd say. As much <laughs> object as possible. Well, the hula hoop is like an obvious movement device, right? So obvious. Mm. A smart so... hula hoop is something I've wanted to make forever. I have one yeah. that's just not been hacked. <laughs> <laughs> there are LED mm. hula hoops, so that could work well. They as a, are. As a, there yeah, are. So nice. Yeah. Um, the bucket, what can you do with a bucket? You stand on it, so that makes it harder, or you put it on your head to limit your vision. Um, the soap is very interesting as a like a, a soft, slippery, it could be something with soap like touch as well. Soap the floor. Soap the floor. Oh, here we go. Soap the floor. <laughs> mm. it's Use the hula hoop. Hoop. Danger zone. Standing on the bucket. <laughs> <laughs> While making a grilled cheese sandwich, how it's long until pan. you yes. die? <laughs> <laughs> that is it. Or playing yes. a beat on the saucepan. Oh, yeah. Oh. I feel like the soap uh, with conductivity could be kind of a cool input as well, like where you touch mm. the soap and mm -hmm. different resistances. Um, maybe the soap bubbles. I don't mm. know. If, can, you, can you make those resistive? That would be so cool. 
Can you oh make God, soap? Yeah. Maybe. I well, mean, I if, we, if you make it with salt, you totally can. So, <laughs> like, you would just have to make it, I think. I mean, we, we have to investigate now. Now I have to know. <laughs> but, um, in theory, if you put salt in soap, it would totally be conductive. Yeah. Well, I wonder if like it, how it affects the, the surface tension and stuff. But yeah, that's one thing we need to investigate. And I guess when it's in a, <laughs> a, a big soapy mass and you touch it at some places, you should be able to test or figure out like, you know, like how much you touch it, like how strong like you big disturb the soap. pile soaps. of bubbles. So that could make sounds, right? Like, mm -hmm. That'd be cool. <laughs> yes. I like Why this. did you move? Why did you, <laughs> you have to do it remotely now? Or you come to Berlin as well. Who suggested soap? That was a very good idea. Soap was so good. <laughs> oh, uh, bouncing on the, there was a robot bouncing on a robot. Oh, oh we had the robot. Word. Yes. Mm. Oh, the kitties. I feel like Robin needs a cat to come into this robot Ooh. situation and ride <laughs> the robot because Robin <laughs> cats, mm. robots. <laughs> That's a good plan. Yes. No, I definitely want to have like games for animals as well. That would be so cool. Mm. Yeah. So, but I yeah, think this so is uh, already a lot of brain food. So very cool suggestions yeah, for sure. And yeah. the, the chat went, uh, well, gave a bunch of great ideas too. Um, apparently the Romer robot is actually a type of robot developed by the MIT in the 60s. I have to admit, I've Ooh, right. never heard of it before. So sorry if we, if if I don't know this. Sorry for my ignorance. I will uh, make something for this. And we have a question that came in the chat. So again, uh, question, a quick question. Um, with all those interactive LED objects, are there any light painting projects? Did you do anything with light painting? I, I haven't done anything with it, but it's definitely okay. uh, on my radar. Like the LEDs would be able to do it. Um, you just need like really high refresh rate and then do some fancy masks and uh, there you are. Um, uh, it would be a cool project, but I haven't uh, haven't done anything yet myself. Same for you, Phoenix. What was the question? Oh, <laughs> did you work with light painting at oh, some point? Um, no. Okay. <laughs> I did live <laughs> I did live experimental video. That's enough. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um I think we are running slightly late. Um do you have anything to add maybe? I wouldn't like you to stop without mentioning something important. I think the one thing I'd like to say is that it is so wonderful to be on a show with hosted by other people, I know get what I'm talking about. And that is just <laughs> so cool <laughs> and so lovely. So thank Same. you for doing this. And thanks well, to Andy Cade for hosting it. Thanks a lot for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you. And it's really easy uh, with talkative guests. I'm really glad you have so much to say. It makes <laughs> our job way easier. So that's cool. <laughs> Robin, a last one maybe? Um, something to say. Yeah. I mean, like I would say like you should, if you haven't tried, ooh, uh, yeah, it's time to wrap this up for sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> um, uh, making things with hardware is easier than ever now. So you should definitely give it a go. If you haven't, uh, I just, um, played with my, with my partner with the makey makey the other day, you don't even need to program and you can get like super physical things right out of the box within like five minutes, uh, just open a browser page and click something together. Mm. So um, I encourage everyone to make weird hardware experiments and uh, it's it's a cool growing scene and it's very much in its infancy still, I would say. And so there's a lot of space for innovation and cool ideas. It's not as overcrowded as mobile games or whatever else. Um, so we definitely need more cool people in the space. and. Uh, to, to join our ranks and make weird experiments. Yes. Come bleed with us. Come cut <laughs> your fingers and fail to sleep and wonder, hook, a, use electricity plus water. Great idea. <laughs> well, I think that's an awesome last one. Come bleed with us. Uh, it's definitely not <laughs> ominous at all. <laughs> 
So uh, let's uh, wrap it up. <laughs> how um, many times have we cut ourselves today, people? Today? Yeah. It's been zero <laughs> days since accident in Game Lab. <laughs> and that's the fun in it, obviously. Absolutely. It's true, it's true. So uh, maybe uh, let's go, Alistair, with the, the last ones we have to mention. Yes. Um, Thank you very much, please. everyone. Yes, thank you, uh, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Indy Cade, obviously, for hosting us. Thank you to Phoenix and Robin for being here and uh, speaking to us. It's been a fantastic, like, really inspiring conversation. Thank you so much.